Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. So today we're going to be talking about history. If you knew me in real life, and for those very few who do, you'll know I do love history. I'm a decent steward of history. And in these times of the flu's trying to kill everyone in the world again, I feel like now's a good time to talk about some history. And since it's about a century from some things that happened, Let's talk about some things that happened a century ago. So I'm going to be talking in a very right and wrong way. I'm going to be some dumb American. Because as an American who actually knows about the world, I know things. Most of my other countrymen don't know Jack. They can't find our own damn country on a map. Oh, they can't even find their own state on a map. Okay? So, for those guys who know next to nothing about the outside world, apart from, we fought Nazis, we fought, and we fought the Japanese, and that's about as much as they know about the outside world, and there's China and Russia. And England, because they do know England, at least. And any places they've actually physically visited, like, I don't know, like Bermuda or something like that, that's all they know. I want to change that. I'm going to give you the very condensed version of how the Republic of Ireland came to be. And all the bloodshed that happened to go with it. Because, you know, civil wars are bloody. You'll know that. We went to Gettysburg. And, and Antietam. So, we're going to start... The year is 1914, World War One has just started, but we're not calling it that just yet, so we're going to, for the rest of this video, if I hopefully remember right, we're going to be calling it the Great War. So the Great War has just flared up. The Germans and the Austrians are in open hostility against Russia, who then spring over and call in the French and the English. The English, at this point in time, Ireland is still part of... I think it's called the Triple Crown, but there's four nations under it. I I don't know. Uh, what what? It's under the British Crown. Okay, it's 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 ruled under King George V. It's not Queen Liz yet. It's not Lizzie yet. She doesn't come until the 50s. But her father, King George V, puts out a proclamation of any young man able to serve in the British Army, because now we need to jump ahead just ever so slightly to 1915. The song has happened. The British are very wiped out and realized, oh dear God, we need stuff. But most importantly, we need men. So the word has been put out for every able man in the army. If you want to volunteer, that's fantastic, but we're going to be sending around conscription cards, and you better show up. Now, some... Now, this goes to all the nations under their domain, the British Empire. So, Australia gets the call, New Zealand gets it, Canada gets it. Most importantly, Ireland also gets it. And this is where the Easter Rising kind of has its start. For you see, there was a background hum. I mean, there's always a background hum. But there... But the, at this point, the hum was literally very much a very quiet chanting of, Do you hear the people sing, I think. And this hum was, Fuck off, England. Let us be. We can rule ourselves. We did it before you showed up. We can do it after. And, well, this hum slowly kind of manifested itself when the British called every able Irishman and even if you didn't want to join you're joining conscription when Irish boys and young men were getting called up to service there is a split between what some there was a split between what people thought they should do to this number one it is very much ingrained in the Irish character of telling the English to go fuck themselves because it's fun to do Go ask everybody who used to be British. <laughs> I mean, America can tell you much about that. But 
what happened was some people said that we shouldn't help the British Empire. This is our opportunity to have an open rebellion and for the most part be unchecked. But others insisted, no, we need to go and fight because then we've got the training and the experience to go and kill British soldiers that show up when we finally rebel after the war. And this, this toward, it toward the people part, okay? This toward that the the, the I'm gonna call, it, I'm just gonna call it Ireland, because technically it's not a republic yet. It tore Ireland apart. Now, 1916 is where the story picks up for Easter, for the Easter Rising. This mostly happened in in uh, in Dublin. There are a few little hot spots of other places, but this is, but it's mostly contained in Ireland. Now, uncharacteristically, I actually have brought up the Wikipedia pages for the Easter Rising and Bloody Sunday. Uh, this is the 1920 Bloody Sunday, not 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 the Bloody Sunday of this one. Is there? There's a lot of different Bloody Sundays, man. But this one, but we're going to be talking specifically about 19. 16th Bloody Sunday. Because this is kind of where the Republic of Ireland starts. Because it's arg you can argue that there's te there's two points where Ireland became a republic. You can argue 1916 when is when the Republic started. Or you can go with what the British say and say it's 1920 or thereabouts. Might be 1918, I don't know. I, I, I know I know enough to know to say that I know, but I don't know enough to fully remember. But this is when Roald Dahl begins, okay? In 1916. So I'm gonna count so I'm, I count it as 1916. Sue me. So here is where things get interesting. Because this is when the entirety of uh, of Ireland, I guess, really does begin, because the Easter Rising officially does have a, pro a proclamation that set that, and this is a rebel. This is a rebellion government, so it holds some kind of sway, I guess, but not really. The on McNeil, the the leader of the uh, movement of Sinn Féin, uh, which if, and I'm very much doubtful of what I'm about to say, but I'm still gonna say it anyways. I'm sorry. I need I need to fact check this, but Sinn Féin, if I remember right, is Home Rule. That's that's the name of it. I think. I re don't quote me on that. But. This is when McNeil officially reads out the proclamation declaring Ireland the island is going to be a republic and they're formally telling the English to fuck off. This is not your land anymore. This land belongs to the people of Ireland. As you can imagine, the British were like, no, it's not. Shut up. Fall in line with Scotland and Wales. And the rest of our empire, damn it. So, this culminates in the Royal Irish Constabulary, who are the official British, so uh, the Irish British mixed soldiers. I say mixed because it's the mixture of the two nations, peoples. This there, this is the art. This is the Irish army essentially. The official. Irish army. I'm going to say official because, again, England didn't recognize the Irish people saying, this is our, we're, we're our own thing. So, the British sent in the army, and they actually sent in the British army. So, the RIC and the British have been called in. You have the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizens Army 
again, I, th I think these are pro. T I think these are the proto. Uh, the proto Provo. Provo is provincial Irish. Uh, Republican army. Yeah, Irish Republican army. Although it's been changed to Irish Revolutionary Army. Uh, as a nod to them kind of being terrorists. You know, not good guys. So, but they're still a little bit away. A little bit. So, the Easter Uprising is exactly what it sounds like. This happened around and on, I think, Easter Sunday. So, what happened was that the and screw I'm just gonna call I'm just gonna call them them what they later became, which is the Royal Ulster Constabulary. So the RUC. So the RUC showed up and they took some major points in Dublin. They took Town Hall. They took uh, I think also a few small landing points on the river. They took the post office, I know that. But they didn't secure enough of the major points. Like, you know, the railroad station. <laughs> that was still very much under British control. And the British promptly shelled the city. And shot the city to shit with the RIC and the actual army showing up. This happened over a few days, by the way. But this laid the foundation of a lot of bloodshed. Okay? To, to put this into perspective, I'm, I'm going to read directly from Wikipedia here. There were, in total, around 2,000 to 3,000 Irish volunteer soldiers for the rebellion and brought and 1250 Irish official uh, dis, uh, dissident soldiers who took part in this fighting the British with the RIC combined had 17,000 troops yes this is some very uphill odds because it's about four to one the British have a lead in. And it wouldn't surprise you to believe that the British won. But this was the thing that firmly cemented Sinn Féin in the eyes of the Irish people. Because up to this point, Sinn Féin was a small party who barely squeaked the win that gave him the confidence to say the proclamation of the Republic. Which is officially what the document that they read out is called. Okay? Yet, surprisingly, I, I'm, I'm seriously going to say this. This was one of those very lightly blooded battles that um, uh, the RUC and the RSC would be fighting over this period. Because only, only about 200 and nine people died. That's that's both on the British side and the uh, RUC side. Although I should be calling them the ICA and the Volunteers. But I'm brushing past that. I'm going with the later name because they're going to show up later. So what happened? So that's that's the Easter Rising essentially all caught up. I'm sorry to every Irishman who's listening to this. That is grossly wrong. Yet yeah, there's some kernels of truth in there. Again, I'm putting this in dumb American speak because we know nothing. So, we're going to jump now to the thing that happened at, in November. In November, officially, this is going to be 100 years ago that Bloody Sunday came to be. November 21st. That you, if the this happened about two years after world uh, after the Great War ended, okay, two years after the Great War ended, Bloody Sunday happened. At this point, officially Ireland has been made a republic, 
with the with I think it actually is the Ulster section of Ireland breaking away, which is six counties. Uh, I know it's County Down Londonbury, County County Tyrone. I'm, I'm, I can't remember the other. Uh, the one that has Belfast in it. Uh, actually, I think. No. There's six. Listen, Google what the counties of Northern Ireland are, and and you'll find it. Okay. So, this is officially where. This is officially where, the bloodshed gets, to some of the worst, and horrifyingly involves civilians more than normal. As you can imagine, it's a war, it's a lot of civilian casualties in this. But this one is more explicit. Now, because there's a lot of dissidents in, you know, the whole Irish disappearing from uh, the English rule, the English are rightfully pissed. And we already know that the English are on the island, and they've got their loyal boys out. And this culminates in a lot of different battles. Well, this is also where the IRA, the, the terrorist one, this is now where I can officially say the provost have officially landed. So this is where the provost come in. Because the provost, who at the time are actually just the IRA, I'll get hopefully maybe one day to that distinction of what's the difference. Um, so, this is where things get very hairy. The IRA, under the orders of Michael Collins, who I, f I remember right, is the man who took over after uh, after the leaders of the Easter Rising were all executed. Yes, they were all executed because they're the leaders of a terror of, you know, essentially number one a rebellion and number two a terrorist cell which hasn't officially started yet. Yeah, everyone's getting killed. And there are women included in there. Because women in this were actually very key. Come on, a man. Come on, a man. Let me let me say it a little slower so you can understand. Uh, otherwise known as the Women's Front. I think that's actually how it translates to. But here's what happened. Early morning of Sunday, November 21st, 1920, under the orders of Michael Collins, the order was given to members of the IRA to assassinate members of the Cairo gang who were civil who were crack British soldiers in civilian clothes hilariously from Egypt because Egypt at this point was still under the British heel I'm watching not anymore this is about the time when Egypt also gets its independence but the but uh, they were from Egypt and they were some of the best assassins the British had to offer and the IRA found out who they were and where they lived and how to and they were gonna have to eliminate them but Tim but Michael Collins also called for the assassination of prominent members of the British Army officers uh, the British Army officer corps who were in Ireland leading the soldiers and also members of the RIC, the Loyal Irish Army, the the British Royal, the the loyal the Brit the Irish people who are loyal to the British, who are soldiers, and a few other you know odds and ends people of importance to the British. That goes with mixed results. Some skied, some don't. But what does but what this does do is call in, is force the British to call in. Yet again, the Black and Tans. The Black and Tans are some of the most fierce British fighters. Well, 
Irish, British fighters. It's, it gets kind of confusing how I describe it, but again, these are loyal, we want to be British citizens, not Irish citizens. Those guys. So, this, call, this promptly calls them in. Now, they're called black and tans because they wear, they wear black and tan. Most of their uniform is tan, with black boots, black belt, black beret, and you know, their trim pieces are black, but their clothes are tan. Hence the name. Some of the most fierce fighters of the British Army, actually during uh, the Great War as well. Uh, before the Gurkhas became a thing. We'll talk about them some other day. But this res but this assassination attempt on some of their members, their leaders, and you know, the British, on a day where they mutually said, we're going to kind of chill out for a little bit. Yes. Yes. They were a truce. Oh, this promptly came out with the full force of retaliation. At this point, it's literally hit and run, hit and run. So, Black and Tans come over in an armored vehicle. It's a Ford Model T with some, I'm gonna guess is some rejected naval armor on it. Some, like, like some very very thin cruiser, or I mean a very thin destroyer armor on it, but this is a special armored vehicle, because it has machine guns, two Lewis guns, and every soldier in there has a Lee Enfield and revolvers. They pull up to a Gaelic football match in Croke Park, in Croke Park, and I, I really feel like I need to preface this. To, to my knowledge, and to a lot of historians' knowledge, there are no soldiers of the IRA there. There may be some sympathizers, but no one is actively, you know, shooting at the British. Uh, or at least from there. The British and the black the black and tans let me, let me just say it right. Black and tans open fire on a civilian crowd who are just playing football. This is Gaelic football, not American football or regular football, which an American would call soccer. So they're not playing soccer and they're not playing uh thing and they're not playing our version of football. Now this fatally kills fourteen. Oh, well, this kills fourteen civilians and wounds at least sixty others. At the end of the day, this is a. Uh, I'm gonna read directly from Wikipedia right here. That evening, three Irish Republican suspects being held at Dublin Castle were beaten and killed by their captors who said they were trying to escape. So, in total this day has seen four, uh, has seen 17 people dead with at least 60 others injured. Now, Remember, this is all in the hope of getting rid of the British. Okay? Oh, wait, oops, I missed some, I missed some people. There, I, mean, I mean, the assassination times I did say, they, some marks, some didn't. So, I mean, we're, we're not counting them just yet. That would be another 15, so... We'd be looking at somewhere just shy of. Did I say something before? 32. 32 dead at the end of this day. It's. It's tragedy. 
And this would continue on for about another three years after after this. Until definitively the British had finally completely hammered out what would happen to Ireland. It would I mean it was always gonna be that in the days of home rule, which was a movement for the Irish people to get their island under their rule and not the British. It was always believed that they were going to do it under the Austro-Hungarian model of having two capital cities. One for the Brit one for the six counties that didn't want to leave and one for the Irish Republic. And that did happen. We have Belfast as the capital of Northern Ireland and Dublin as the capital of Ireland in general. This, this, I think, does cover it all. Or at least what I want to cover for right now. Everything, the war officially ended in 1923. But the players would still keep on playing. Just because technically the war is over, there's still a battle to be won. And that battle would not end until actually the 90s. Yeah, can you believe that? The 90s. <laughs> 1991. Officially, when a ceasefire that has lasted to this day has happened. Where the provisional Irish Republican Army and the actual Irish Republican Army, the one who's actually backed by the Irish people and aren't terrorists, because the provisional Irish Republican Army, the Provost, yeah, they did a lot of the things that kind of happened to the World Trade Center in the history before 9-11. You know, a lot of car bombs underneath it and a lot of shootings near it. Yeah, yeah. if you read the history of uh, the World Trade Center, you'll find out, Jesus Christ, what, 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 is, what, is their, what is the terrorist problem with it? And it's literally kind of the same thing over in Ireland that during the... 60s and 70s when things got reheated up again well uh, I, I, yeah I guess that is everything that I want to talk about at least today again I'm going to preface this very much right now this is not a act. it's not a very accurate and not a very concise way of talking about this but, as a stepping off point for dumb Americans who don't know anything about the outside world, this is a good stepping stone. Maybe one day I'll cover, maybe one day I'll redo this video and actually have it a lot more concise but and a lot more factually accurate, like actually having fully done research and written up a script for this. But for right now, that's not happening. But I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know if you actually want this to be a little bit of a series. Because I kind of want this to be a little bit of a series. But, yeah, again, thank you guys so much for watching. And remember, nothing in this world <sighs> oh, geez, is without sin. And happy Easter, because it's actually being recorded. Uh... A few days before Easter. So, there you go.